My name is Noah Crusoe, and I'd like to begin today with a moment of respectful silence for the ordinary human being. We try so hard, us mortals, but the fact is that we're nothing more than fleshy water bags who work in offices, pay bills, and sometimes forget the lefty-loosey, righty-tighty rule. We live in anonymity and die in obscurity about as noticeable as a potato. Sure, some of the brave or foolhardy ones will try to do interesting things, never aware of the insurmountable gulf between our own averageness and the creative and intellectual luminaries who can actually make meaningful contributions. <laughs> One of the many ways in which my own overwhelming averageness can be measured is in my inabilities, which I have in spades. I can't do that thing where you stick your fingers in your mouth and whistle. I can't do math or spell words in my head. And I'm really bad at estimating distances of either the literal or the metaphorical kind. That last one is important because it turns out I've been overestimating the distance between us average schmucks and those creative and intellectual giants my whole life, by a lot. But I didn't know that until I wrote and illustrated this book called Saturday. Let me explain. I'm an illustrator. It's not the most common job in the world, but it's not unheard of. And just about every aspect and every result of that job is so normal, it's near invisible. When you're leafing through a magazine or scrolling through a website, and for a millisecond, you glance at an accompanying image, and then you can't remember you even looked at it, that's what I do. <laughs> I draw the stuff you can't even remember you saw. I do so from home, which is even more boring than an office. There's no one around I can chit-chat with or steal lunch from. Maybe the only extraordinary thing about what I do is how much I love it. I drew when I was a little kid, a lot, but I wasn't a prodigy. My drawings were awful, mostly robots and ninjas. And again, if there was anything extraordinary about what I did, it wasn't the quality. It was how excited I was to be doing it. I also read a lot. And by reading, I mean, you know, looking at pictures. <laughs> Holling Clancy Holling's books, Rianne Portfleet, Tintin Adventures, Frank Frazetta. These weren't human beings. Somewhere in some stately marble hall where your footsteps echo and you speak in reverent, hushed tones. There were bronze effigies to these titans who never ate ketchup or worried about the power bill. Even as a kid, without being told, I understood that these were special people in another league, from another planet, like Krypton, or look at me, I'm so special and perfect planet, which is somewhere in the outer edges of the jerkwad solar system. <laughs> Even as a kid, without being told, I understood that these were special people. But I loved drawing so much that I wasn't afraid to be drawing in the long, deep shadow cast by their talent. Later on, in spite of what turned out to be totally sensible advice from my mom, I went to college and majored in art, drew crummy political cartoons for a couple of years, and eventually blundered into freelance illustration. So there I was, wallowing in my own averageness, driving around a mostly unrusted 1994 Toyota Camry, and eating my meals at the finest gas station when I had this idea for a book, one I'd never really seen before. To be fair, I was terrified. I didn't know the first thing about writing or illustrating books. In fact, the reason my imaginary book had gathered dust on an imaginary shelf was because every time I would think about starting that book, I would think first about the laundry list of things I didn't know how to do. And it was a long list. It had regular points and sub points. But I was also curious, and I knew it would be fun. Drawing is the one place where I'm willing to follow my curiosity in spite of my own reservations. What's the worst that could happen? Well, I guess the worst thing that could happen is I would start drawing the book and then somehow my face would catch on fire. <laughs> but it's more likely that I would try it, it would turn out crappy, and I'd give up. And that's not so bad. If that turned out to be the case, I could just bury the idea in the backyard, like a goldfish or a burned quiche, and no one would be the wiser. 
So that's how Saturday started. It was about as profound as a rerun of Wheel of Fortune. And what I had in mind was a king-sized graphic novel slash children's book with a lot of lavishly drawn detail on every panel. It would have crazy characters, goofy jokes, and strange cultural references, sure. But what I really wanted was a book that the 10-year-old me and the 30-year-old me would both want to pick up and explore. I wanted a book you could get lost in, and I did get lost in it. The aspects of the book that made it fun and exciting for me also made it an astounding amount of work. Saturday took me nearly nine years to finish, and every inch of it was fun. Now, it's super important to note that I don't think Saturday qualifies as great art, or that having finished Saturday, I'm now among those luminaries with their own bronze statues. But I do think it's cool. I think it's fun and interesting, but that's beside the point. Even if you think this thing is worth its weight in soggy bread, you can look at it and see just how much work it took to bring this thing to fruition. It's an intimidating amount of work, one I never ever thought I would be able to finish. I was always my biggest doubter and critic, mostly because of my awareness of my own extraordinary ordinariness and of the distance between a human like me, who once shaved off his own eyebrow, and the kind of genius and talent capable of making something cool. But I didn't just sit, sit down one day and say, I'm gonna make an epic, sprawling, ambitious book, and then just do it. You ever see one of those old-timey cartoons where someone dangles a carrot on a fishing pole in front of a donkey to get it to pull a cart? It was more like that. The drawing was so much fun, I didn't even notice the cart was behind me. And also, because of that fun, I pulled that cart a distance I thought couldn't be traveled by someone like me. Because I have to be tricked into doing anything worthwhile. <laughs> It'd be like if I ate nothing but mozzarella for six months, and at the end I found out I'd accidentally competed in a triathlon. I never actually meant for something productive to result. I just think cheese is really, really delicious. <laughs> I think my concept of how cool things get made was also a bit screwy. I guess I figured that not only were there special people bestowed with godlike artistic or intellectual acumen, but also that these people thought of what they wanted to make and then just instantly willed those things into existence. I never thought about Faulkner chewing a, on the end of a pencil and pacing around a room or Renoir having to throw a sketch in the trash because he got nacho cheese dip on it. And then he tried to wipe it off, but it just smeared and made it worse. But we're not privy to their struggle, so we assume it came easily to them. Remember that first thing I said about how ordinary people are and how they can't accomplish anything interesting? I still think half of that is true. People are ordinary, but it's the ordinary people who make the interesting things. And the art and literature and science that I admire and adore, pretty much all of that was authored by regular folks. It's a thought that's both depressing and exciting at the same time. Depressing because it means there aren't really superhumans. There's something comforting about the idea of infallible people who always have the right answers. I guess because we could turn to them the way kids turn to parents when they're confused or scared and they need to know what's going on. But it's exciting because it means we, ordinary people, can make extraordinary contributions in spite of our own infinite limitations. So go forth and be ordinary. Go and make your thing, whatever it is. And when you're struggling with the work and with yourself and with your fears about whether or not someone like you can actually make something cool, don't forget that you're an ordinary human being, that there's a proud legacy of normal people making abnormally cool stuff. Part of a long line of humans who sometimes put the milk away in the oven, bang their shins on coffee tables, and sometimes create things so beautiful it makes your heart stand still. That your struggle with ordinary is part of the distillation that's responsible for bringing lovely things to fruition. Thank you.